So good to see you. So glad to be here. I do want to say real quick, a uh, great day yesterday. The youth handed out those boxes, and I mean, it was a good day. They were waiting on us at 9, and so we had a good crowd. We were actually able to go door to door and give some out around this the community right here, and it was a great work that was done. And I'm so thankful for our youth, and I appreciate their love for the Lord. And it's, it is an encouragement to me, I know, to you as well. Amen? We're continuing our series on trusting and obeying, and we come to Elijah. I kind of referred to this last week in talking about David and Goliath, where David's trust and his faith, it was unwavering when it came to Goliath. But at the end, we talked about in Psalm chapter three, that there was sometimes a doubt uh, from David. Sometimes uh, in the Psalms, he had moments where he fell short in his confidence, just like we all do. Amen. And today I want to specifically deal with that. I want to talk about that. You know, the most important lesson that we can learn as a Christian is to trust God. Nothing else compares, really, you know. If I don't trust God the right way, everything else is not going to be what it needs to be in my relationship uh, with Christ. Nothing comes close. You know, when we know what we're doing and what God has called us to do, isn't there this sense of security? You know, that protection that surrounds us. Uh, David refers to it in the psalm that I just said, Psalm 3. He says, but you, O Lord, you are a shield for me, my glory, and the one who lifts up my head. Would you say that that's you and you're thinking about the Lord, that he is the one who ultimately lifts your head up? When we trust in God, you know, our decisions, while they may seem tough, are made confidently because our mind and our hearts are focused not on what we want to do, but on what God wants us to do. See, that's a huge difference, isn't it? See, it's not on what I want to do, but it's focused on what God wants me to do. But sometimes, don't we find ourselves saying, Lord, am I doing the right thing? Did I make the right decision? Are you okay really with what I'm doing? We begin to feel like we're not trusting him when we begin to think this way. We all do it though, don't we? But God wants us to pray to him. See, God wants us to ask him and draw closer to him. Psalm 10, 17 is a powerful thought when it comes to that because he says, Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. I'm coming to you and I'm asking you, Lord, and I'm struggling, Lord. And you will prepare my heart. (laughs) See, I want God to prepare my heart. How about you? See, I want God to prepare my heart for the way it needs to be when I'm dealing with a situation, when I'm going through a tough time, when I'm happy and rejoicing. See, I want God to prepare my heart. And he finishes off by saying, you will cause your ear to hear. (laughs) God hears our prayers. He knows all about those silent cries of our hearts. But he also knows our joys, doesn't he? See, we can trust him fully because he knows all about us and he loves us so very much. When it comes to trusting God, there are several people in the Bible whom we could list, and we've talked about several. Uh, You know, Moses and David and, and Joseph and Isaiah and Jeremiah, Paul, Peter, John, and many others. 
But while there were times when these men and women in the Bible demonstrated great faith, there were also moments when their faith and their trust in God went missing. Take, for instance, Moses, his anger with the people when he hits the rock because he's mad. And he says, you bunch of rebels. God said, you didn't trust me in Numbers 20. Or when David made the terrible decision to count Israel's fighting men in 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 1 and following, he didn't trust God. Or as we're going to talk about this morning, Elijah the prophet, y'all know the story, stood on Mount Carmel and defeated every one of the prophets of Baal. We're going to look at it just briefly. But yet hours later, he was on the run. He was in fear of his life. See, 450 false prophets. 450, y'all, could not accomplish what one angry queen was able to do. What was this one angry queen able to do? She was able to frighten God's messenger to the point of running away from where God had placed him. Brethren, oh, how familiar that is. I want to encourage you with one thing this morning. Don't let Satan steal your joy. Because he wants to. Question. When does strong faith, when does immovable faith turn into fear? You know, that answer is really easy. It's when we take our eyes off of the source of our strength. When we take our eyes off who we put our trust in. And when we place our eyes and we focus our attention on the circumstance. When we fix our eyes on our personal desires. Or things that we know aren't God's will. Any time that we pause to consider a way other than God's way, you know what we do, brethren? We run the risk of turning our trust into fear. First thing to consider this morning is this. Elijah ran. There was no reason for Elijah to become overcome, to be controlled, to be held in bondage with fear. See, God had gained this great victory. And his prophet was at the forefront. He was at the front of this. But this didn't stop the enemy from harassing him through thoughts of death and fear. Instead of going out to meet Jezebel, Elijah heads off in the opposite direction and ended up hiding out in a cave, explaining to God how he arrived at this point. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 10. This is what he says to the Lord in the cave. He says, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. <laughs> I've been serving you, God. I've been doing what you told me to do. But all the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, man. I can't even hang around the people. They don't even want to do what you ask. They've torn down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And I am the only one left. And they want to kill me. Could you imagine these words... Coming from God's prophet, the man of such tremendous faith, the only one who boldly challenged hundreds of false prophets. What am I talking about? Look with me. First Kings chapter 8. 
Look at verse 17. We're not going to go through it all, but I want to just hit some highlights. It's a great story. Then it happened when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said to him, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? And he answered, I'm not troubled, Israel, but you and your father's house have, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the Baals. Now therefore send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asher who eat at Jezebel's table. I want you to get all of Israel. I want you to get all them false prophets and I want you to meet me on the mountain. This is Elijah now. Can you tell the tone of the confidence in his voice? So Ahab sent for all the children, verse 20. They gathered all of them on the mountain. And then verse 21, Elijah says this. He came to all the people. He said, how long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. And the people said, nothing. So Elijah said to the people, I alone am left. A prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to get two bulls. You get a bull and I'll get a bull. You cut it up, you put it on the altar, and then you cry out to Baal and you get him to send fire down on this uh, burnt offering and then I'm going to do the same. And whoever's God does it is the one true God. That's the deal that gets made. So verse 26, so they took the bull which was given them and they prepared it, called on the name of Baal from morning to uh, evening till noon, saying, oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, no one answered. Then they leaped about the altar which they had made. And so it was at noon. Now remember, this is Elijah that we were just talking about. Uh, so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and he said, cry loud for he is a God. Either he's meditating or he's busy or he's on a journey or perhaps he's sleeping and he must be awakened. Hey man, I figured it out. The reason why you ain't got fire coming down is because your God is asleep. <laughs> Wake him up. Y'all ain't yelling loud enough. So what do they do? They begin to cut themselves. They begin to do all kinds of crazy things. In verse 29, it says, When midday was passed, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. From the morning until the evening, they've been at it. They've been trying to get Baal to send down fire, but there was no voice, no one answered, and no one paid attention. And then Elijah steps up. He said to all the people, come near. So all the people came near. He repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took 12 stones, according to the number of the tribes of the son of Jacob. Verse 32, then with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench around the altar, large enough to hold two sheaves of seed. He put the wood in order, cut the bull, he laid it on the wood and said, Fill four water pots with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice on the wood. Four pots poured onto the altar. And then he says, verse 34, do it again. And they did it a second time. And then he said, do it again. And they did it a third time. And so the water ran all around the altar and he also filled the trench with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said this with a soaking wet altar that had been poured with water on it. He comes near to it and this is what he says. Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel. And I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. And verse 38 says this, the fire of the Lord fell 
and consume the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces. They said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. What an awesome story, amen? God showed up and showed out. (laughs) There was no answer from Baal because there's only one God and that's the living God. That's the God of the Bible, amen? But after all that, After that whole situation takes place, after the fire of the Lord consumes the the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the dust, and the water, and everything else around it, swallows it up. After the prophets of Baal are executed, what does this prophet, what would you do? I'll tell you what i do. You want to mess with me? (laughs) Did you not see that fire that just came down? That's the God I serve. How about you? What confidence I would have. But after all that's done, Jezebel, the queen, sends a message. Look at 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 through 4. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. And verse 4 says this, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die and said, (laughs) It is enough now, Lord. Take my life for I'm no better than my father's. What? What in the world? He ran for his life, brethren, and he went a day's journey, and he went under a tree, and his prayer request was this, just kill me. The confident, the ever-trusting prophet in the Almighty has now become one that would rather be dead than go any further because of the situation put in his life. Now, brethren, can you feel that? So Elijah, after a 40-day journey running off the nutrients, and I ain't got time for this, verses 5 through 8. He's running off the nutrients of this divine food given to him by an angel. He ends up in a cave, and the Lord says, Elijah, what are you doing? But God's response is incredible. See, I love what God says to Elijah as he was hiding in the cave. You want to know what God didn't do? God didn't acknowledge his servant's lack of faith. (laughs) See, it was obvious that Elijah was struggling. It was obvious that he was emotionally, spiritually, and physically struggling. He was frightened, he was scared. He didn't think that he could go back because he was sure that he was going to be killed. 1 Kings 19, 10, he says, And they seek to take my life, Lord. He didn't know how he'd go forward. He had allowed his circumstance to block his trust in the Almighty, and fear had taken a hold. It had captured him. He was cuffed.
Matt, I don't have no problems like that, man. <laughs> I appreciate you up there being emotional about this, but I mean, that really doesn't, okay, just wait. Just wait till something happens in your life where you think, Lord, where are you at? And we'll see if your trust in Yahweh, your trust in the Lord becomes fear like it did to this man. 450 prophets gone. A fire from heaven that showed everybody in Israel, everybody in that place that day, that who God was, was the God from above. And this is where he's at. But here it is. Even though Elijah had lost focus on God, God hadn't lost focus of him. Now I want you to hear this one. God's faithfulness has nothing to do with our circumstance. <laughs> now wait a minute, Matt. Just hold on. God knew exactly what he was going to do to Elijah. You want to know what he was going to do? He was going to refresh him. He was going to renew him. And he was going to restore the faith of his prophet. The Lord commanded Elijah to do something. And I want you to look at it. 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 11 through 13. Then he said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, Elijah. And behold... The Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in the pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. So it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing, Elijah? What are you doing here? God could have announced his coming in any way. But how did he reveal himself to the struggling prophet? By the great wind that tore the rocks? No. Nope. By the earthquake? No. What about the fire? Surely? No. It was the gentle whisper. A still, small Even though Elijah tells his story again in verse 14, the Lord didn't even acknowledge it. You want to know what the Lord did? In his glorious wisdom, he moved way beyond that point. The point of giving in to an evil queen and giving her any power. And you know what he did? He was more interested in getting his prophet back on track. First Kings chapter 19, verse 15, the Bible says, Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Haziel as king over Syria. God's faithfulness to his people. Our God's faithfulness has nothing to do with our circumstances. Why is that? Because he's always there. Waiting for you. No matter what. Oh, you don't know the stuff I did, man. You don't know how I've lived. You don't know the things that I've said. You don't know the people that I hang with. You don't know nothing about that. Oh, yeah. I'm sure I don't, and I'm sure it's terrible, 
But you know what? Our God is so faithful that he's still waiting for you. Elijah, like we do, he lost sight of this. Fear struck a chord in his heart. And suddenly the courageous spirit and the well-trained faith in Elijah, you know what it did? It was gone. It evaporated. But notice what God doesn't do. He didn't harp on Elijah's weakness. He didn't ridicule him for becoming weak under pressure. And when threatened by the enemy, you know what he does instead? And this is the God we serve. He ordered him back to the place where he had left. Why did he do that? Why did he send him right back into the battle? Because Elijah still has some work to do. See, he would begin a new work one that would be passed on to a young prophet named Elisha. In doing this, God gave his prophet a a refresher course in something, in his greatness, in his faithfulness, in his power, and in his infinite wisdom. God came to him in a still, small voice and said, I'm with you. You know, the best parallel to this thought, I remember parents and my kids. I remember just the other day, here's Libby doing something that she wasn't supposed to do. Kept on, kept on, kept on, kept on. So my threat became action. Let's go on the back, about to have a meeting. Y'all know about them. I mean, y'all acting like y'all ain't never had a meeting before, right? You know that meeting. Go in your room and I'll be in there in a minute, right? So I take her back there and we have a meeting. So I talk to her. I tell her, you don't need to be doing this anymore because the next time we come back here, it's not going to be good. And I could tell she's falling apart. Now, if me and Isaac were having this talk, it'd be a whole lot different. Boy, you better straighten up or you're going to get whipped, son. But here's Libby breaking down on me. But I had to hold fast to what I was telling her. So we go back into the living room. Everything was worked out. And I could tell her emotion wasn't right. I could tell she was wavering in her faith. (laughs) She wasn't sure about what was going to happen. And you know what I told her? Come here. You know what she did? Fast as she could. She buried her body into me. God, in the small voice, is saying, come here. I got you. Are we 
as His children willing to bury our body into Him? Are we willing to say, you have control of my life? When threats, when situations, when they rise up in our face, brethren, we must trust God and we must obey Him. Even if our foes want us to run for cover. Brethren, I hope that you hear this. God's faithfulness is so much bigger than our circumstances. Don't ever forget it. I want to close with Psalm 46. Turn with me there. Turn with me, brethren. Psalm 46, verses 1 through 3. Verse 1 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Verse 2 says, therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. Verse 11 The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come here. I got you. Come here. You can handle anything with me. Oh, I'm thankful for the still small voice. How about you, brethren? That big mighty God cares about little old me so very much. Maybe you're here today and you're struggling. Maybe you're here today and you need prayers. Maybe you're here today and you need to become a Christian. Friend, please don't put it off anymore. Today is the day. Today is the day you can be saved from your sin and added to the greatest family ever. By obeying the gospel, believing who Jesus is, believing he came, he died, and resurrected. You do it by repenting, turning from your way of living and turning towards God. You do it by confessing in front of people that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And you do it by being immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. You go in dead and you come out alive spiritually. What an awesome thing. And Jesus said in Revelations 2, verse 10, talking to a church that was struggling with heavy persecution, he said, you guys are going to be put in prison. Things are going to happen to you that are unbelievable. But if you will be faithful to me until death, I will promise you one thing. I'm going to give you a crown of life. Boy, I want that. How about you, brethren? Friend, take the journey to begin the steps at getting that crown. Whatever you need, please come right now. Together we stand and sing.